Hi, I'm Andy Caffrey. Welcome to the Clear the Coast of Nuclear Power Roadshow. This is a presentation designed for activists who are concerned about global warming, concerned about nuclear power, and I'm going to be specifically talking about what's happening with our polar ice sheet situation. I'd like to start with a poem. I've been working on this issue since 1995, and in 2014, NASA announced that the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet is unstoppable. And I worked for 20 years to try to get the world to pay attention to this issue before it became unstoppable. So at this point, I'm very environmentally disturbed. I say to them, how can you buy all this garbage? They say, please, just leave us alone. I say, but you don't need any of this crap. You know ecology begins at home. They say, okay, okay already. I guess you're probably right, but I still want it, so I'm going to get it. Now stop your goddamn preaching, Dwight. I say, that's why it's all breaking down, because no one makes any personal sacrifice. She says, I'll buy whatever I want. The only issue is, can I pay the price? He says, and that's it. No ifs, ands, or buts. And personally, Dwight, I do believe you've gone completely nuts. Nuts? Me? You're the third person who said that today. So you think I'm mad? Really? But I just got my diagnosis right here in front of me. And it's really not all that bad. It says I'm agitated and perturbed. But that I'm not mad at all. I'm just very environmentally disturbed. Now, part of the reason why we haven't done anything about West Antarctica or really about global warming is because of the framing that we have, the things that we tend to think about, especially as Americans. And we can get so distracted by situations in our immediate environment that we have a hard time thinking about problems that are not going to really manifest and affect us for decades or even centuries. So most of you probably don't know much about Antarctica, um, which is kind of the problem. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my early years. I was born in 1957. 1956, 1957 is when we had International Geophysical Year. And that was the first time that scientists around the world first started to study Antarctica. So most of the science we have about what has happened in Antarctica is really quite new. In fact, what the surface layer is like and what the underneath is like, that was only discovered in the 1990s. So in 1957, I was in Los Angeles when I was born. As soon as I was born, I looked out the window, saw the smog, and I coughed. And my whole youth, I was preoccupied with being poisoned. I just couldn't understand how a society could let people be poisoned with a thousand different chemicals. And at the same time, I was very much a fan of Jacques Cousteau and became very concerned about the oceans. And so for me, I saw this problem and kept asking myself, well, how bad is it? What can be done about it? And why is nothing being done about it? In 1957 is also when they started to dump nuclear waste into the ocean. It's when Jack Kerouac was on the road. And uh, two weeks um, after I was born, we launched the first satellite, Sputnik. So I'm about to turn 60. Now, when I was born, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were 315 parts per million. And the lesson I want to convey to you is it matters how far it goes. There are consequences. If we just ignore it or just do little tidbits of, of actions to make changes, the question is, well, is that enough? If someone is doing meth, you don't just tell the person, well, 
Just cut back one line of meth a month and you'll be fine. You're making progress. You need to get the person off meth. So the research I've done and what I'm going to present to you today is how do we determine what is too much? So Isaac, why don't you play the, um, put on the first image? And that uh, shows you the entire continent of Antarctica and the light area extending out from the continent. That's called sea ice. And every winter that grows, you're seeing it in the winter, and then it retreats in the summer. So about pretty much doubles the size. Uh, Antarctica has three main places. You can see on the right is East Antarctica. That's about the size of China. And it is separated from West Antarctica by the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. That's the area to the left. And sticking out from that is the Antarctic Peninsula. And if you heard in the news a couple of weeks ago about an iceberg the size of Delaware breaking off of there, that was the um, Antarctic Peninsula that lost the Delaware-sized iceberg. Now, this is a close-up of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's got this thing called the Larsen Ice Sheet. But it's in different parts. And the part closest to the tip, Larsen A, uh, broke off in 1995. And that's when I first got concerned. When these ice sheets started breaking up, does that, is it global warming that's causing that? And I wrote this article in the Earth Island Journal warning that global warming was going to cause the breakup of the entire West Antarctic ice sheet. And, um, and then in 2002, I was shown to be right that the, the ice sheet is in fact deteriorating and the Larsen B broke off. And then just a couple of weeks ago, you can see the biggest chunk so far, and they've got a little uh, image of the state of Delaware right off the coast there, so you can see how big it is. That broke off. Now, Antarctica's got 90% of all the world's ice. The only other area on Earth that's got a large amount of ice is Greenland. Greenland's got about 10% of the world's ice. So you've got East Antarctica, which has 80% of the world's ice. West Antarctica has about 10% of the world's ice and Greenland has about 10% of the world's ice. Those are continental ice sheets. They're sitting on land. So if they melt, that melt water is added to the ocean, and that causes sea level rise. The sea ice that surrounds Antarctica in the winter, and the sea ice that covers the Arctic, when that melts, it just goes back into the water because it's part of the water. So that doesn't affect sea level at all. So you may have heard a lot about what's happening with the Arctic. Um, West Antarctica is a very different situation. The reason I'm here is because I want you to do something. I'd like you to take the knowledge I'm presenting here and become an activist. Because you see what's happened is we've basically caused the West Antarctic sheet to collapse over the next few decades. And because of that, we're going to see 20 feet of sea level rise over the next well, half century, which means that there's a threat to everything that's on the coast, including our nuclear power plants. Our nuclear power plants are sited about five feet above sea level because they're water cooled. And it takes 60 years to decommission a nuclear power plant. So um, the question is, can we decommission them before the sea level increases? So here you can see that over the last couple of decades, the West Antarctic ice sheet and the Antarctic Peninsula have warmed a lot. In fact, Antarctica and the Arctic are the two areas that have warmed the most over the last several uh, decades because of global warming. This shows you um, the surface underneath the ice sheet. So you can see these light blue areas. Uh, those are the areas that are below sea level. So it's not a very stable situation. West Antarctica, the ice is sitting on the bottom of the ocean. And that's why it's so vulnerable, because as the ocean warms from global warming, it's melting the ice underneath. The ice in East Antarctica is much more stable because it doesn't have this warming water underneath. So, okay, so this is a presentation that NASA has made about several of these situations. No turning back. West Antarctic Glaciers in Irreversible Decline, presented by Science at NASA. Over the years, as temperatures around the world have ratcheted upward, climate change researchers have kept a wary eye on one place perhaps more than any other, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, 
and particularly the fastest melting part of it, the glaciers that flow into the Amundsen Sea. In that region, six glaciers hang in precarious balance, partially supported by land and partially floating in waters just offshore. There's enough water frozen in the ice sheet that feeds these icy giants to raise global sea levels by four feet, if they were to melt. That's troubling because the glaciers are melting. Moreover, a new study finds that their decline appears to be irreversible. We've passed the point of no return, says Eric Renault, a glaciologist working jointly at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the University of California, Irvine. Renault and colleagues have used 19 years of satellite radar data to map the fast-melting glaciers. In their paper, which has been accepted for publication in Geophysical Research Letters, they conclude that this sector of West Antarctica is undergoing a marine ice sheet instability that will significantly contribute to sea level rise in the centuries ahead. A key concept in the Renault study is the grounding line, the dividing line between land and water underneath the glacier. Because virtually all melting occurs where the glacier's undersides touch the ocean, pinpointing the grounding line is crucial for estimating melt rates. The problem is, grounding lines are buried under thousands of feet of glacial ice. It's challenging for a human observer to figure out where they are, Renault explains. There's nothing obvious that sticks out on the surface to say, this is where the glacier goes afloat. To find the hidden grounding lines, they examined radar images of the glaciers made by the European Space Agency's Earth Remote Sensing Satellites from 1992 to 2011. Glaciers flex in response to tides. By analyzing the flexing motions, they were able to trace the grounding lines. This led to a key discovery. In all the glaciers they studied, grounding lines were rapidly retreating away from the sea. In this sector, we are seeing retreat rates that we don't see anywhere else on Earth, Renault says. Smith Glacier's line moved the fastest, retreating 22 miles upstream. The other lines retreated from 6 to 19 miles. As the glaciers melt and lose weight, they float off the land where they used to sit. Water gets underneath the glacier and pushes the grounding line inland. This, in turn, reduces friction between the glacier and its bed. The glacier speeds up, stretches out, and thins, which drives the grounding line to retreat farther inland. This is a positive feedback loop that leads to out-of-control melting. The only natural factor that can slow or stop this process is a pinning point in the bedrock, a bump or projection that snags the glacier from underneath and keeps it from sliding toward the sea. To investigate this possibility, the researchers made a novel map of the bed beneath the glaciers using radar and other data from satellites and NASA's Airborne Ice Bridge mission. The map revealed that the glaciers had already floated off many of their small pinning points. In short, there seems to be no turning back. I'd like to tell you a story about a class I took in high school. It was on intertidal marine biology. Folks here in Monterey should be able to appreciate it. Uh, every day we'd go out into the tide pools and every hour we'd measure the temperature, the salinity, and the pH uh, throughout the course of the day. And then we'd wade out into the ocean and do the same thing. Now what happens is, as the tide retreats and as the sun passes overhead, the water in the tide pools, because it's isolated, will warm up a little bit. That will cause it to evaporate, and that means that there's going to be more salt to water in the tide pool. So over the millions of years, the creatures that evolved in the tide pools developed tolerances to those changes in temperature, salinity, and pH. Now, the creatures that live out in the ocean, however, when the sun passes overhead, it shines down and it's absorbed by the entire global ocean. So there's very little change um, in the temperature, <coughs> excuse me, temperature, salinity, and pH in the ocean. So the creatures out in the ocean don't have to develop very much of a tolerance to changes in temperature, salinity, and pH. In fact, if you take some of those creatures and you put them in a tide pool, you think, well, it's salt water, they should do fine. No, that change in temperature, salinity, and pH in the tide pool is too much for the creatures that are out in the ocean. And there's a term for it. They're called, there's a prefix called steno. So uh, steno means narrow, and a stenothermal creature is a creature that only has narrow tolerances to temperature change. Haline is a word for salt. So a stenohaline creature only has narrow tolerances to changes in salinity. In the tide pool, there are what you call uri. Urihaline and urethermal, and uri means wide. 
So when we look at the ecological crisis in general, and, and I have a background as an Earth First Forest activist, you have to look at what are the tolerances of all of the ecosystems that we have. For example, with atmospheric carbon dioxide and temperature change, you may have heard about 2 degrees centigrade. 350.org suggests that we have to keep the temperature increase from the, in, the pre-industrial era to a limit of 2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial temperature. We're right now at about 1 degree centigrade, so we only have one more degree according to the 350 um, predictions. Now the whole range, though, has only been, for the last 40 million years, 10 degrees centigrade. It's gotten six, down to 6 degrees cooler than it is now, and it's only gotten 4 degrees higher than, it's, than it is, well, 3 degrees higher than now, 4 degrees higher than it was pre-industrial. And when it was at 4 degrees centigrade, there were no ice sheets. So sea level was 80 feet higher than it is now. And in fact, uh, 3 million years ago, it was 80 feet higher than it is now. And the atmospheric CO2 was 400 parts per million. We're now at 409 parts per million. So how do we figure out this concept of urihaline versus stenohaline, urethermal versus stenothermal when it comes to global warming. How much CO2 is too much? Now, this first slide, this shows you atmospheric CO2 levels for the last half billion years. Um, this is the Phanerozoic era, which is the time that there has been a lot of plants on land. So before this, there weren't any plants, and, and if there wasn't any life, then what CO2 levels were like before there was life is really irrelevant. A lot of climate denialists will say, well, CO2 has been a lot higher or whatever. Well, what matters is what kind of ecosystems existed when it was higher. So on the right side there, you can see it's been as high as 7,000 parts per million. And then around two and a half million years ago, it dropped substantially, and that's when um, plant and vegetation on land really expanded. And because of all that vegetation, it sucked carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and dropped it much lower. And the very far left, the little tiny area where there's not very much variation at all, that's the Pleistocene. That's the last two and a half million years. And that's the era that we live in now. This is the era of ice ages. I'll tell you a little about that. Um, the, the, Pliocene was from five to three million years ago, and then something very interesting happened three million years ago. North and South America were separated from each other. There was no Central America. And so the Atlantic waters, the Atlantic Ocean waters, passed through the Straits of Panama into the Pacific Ocean. But because of continental drift, the two continents came together, and the land that Central America rose up above sea level, and it cut off the Atlantic. And so the currents from the Gulf of Mexico changed, and they started to move up the East Coast. And that's the Gulf Stream that we talk about. And what happens is the Gulf Stream waters, it gets colder near Iceland. It gets colder and saltier, and it sinks. And it drives an entire ocean conveyor belt around the world. Now, this is a concern because Greenland is melting, and the Greenland fresh water is diluting that saltier water up near Iceland. And so it's slowing down. It's slowed down 11% so far in just the last 50 years. Now the problem is, it's really bad, is if it slows down entirely and stops, this ocean conveyor is the way that oxygen gets down to the bottom of the ocean. And if it, it's happened before, during the five previous extinctions on Earth, the current stopped and the bottom of the ocean became anoxic. There was no oxygen down there. And this sulfur bacteria that lives in anoxic environments developed. And over about 300 years, it rose to the surface and got into the top layer of the ocean, which is called the photic zone. That's where the light can penetrate. Beneath that, it's about 30 or 40 feet. It just gets too dark. And so once it got into the uh, photic zone, it destroyed most of the ocean life on Earth. Now, the concern that scientists have now with Greenland is because we've got this incredible acceleration on melting. What we're doing now is melting the entire ice world, which is called the cryosphere, faster than ever before 
in the whole 4.6 million year history of the Earth. And so, so much fresh water can be added that it could stall this thing long enough that this happens again. And about 300 years after it stops, and it could stop in the next 100 or 200 years, the same phenomenon of sulfur bacteria will get up to the top layers, kill all life in the oceans, and then the worst part is it percolates into the atmosphere and goes up and destroys the ozone layer. And that wipes out most of terrestrial life on Earth. So when people talk about global warming, can it cause planetary extinction? Yes, it can. And that's why I'm very environmentally disturbed, because in the entire 2016 presidential campaign, nobody was talking about this. Nobody. So um, when North and South America came together about three million years ago, in addition to changing the currents, we entered this era called the Pleistocene. And that's an era that oscillates between ice ages and non-ice ages. They're called glacials and interglacials. And the last glacial period started about 120,000 years ago. And it lasted until about 12,000 years ago. And the ice has been overall retreating and, and melting in general before humans came along. Um, and so we're in this interglacial period that we've been in for about as long as interglacials exist. What happened is we got into this period, the Pleistocene, and this is the era of the woolly mammoths and, and, and all the saber-toothed cats and all the large mammals that existed, um, where they thought it was because of wobbles in the Earth's orbit that we'd go into these cycles where you'd have this glacial period where ice sheets built up covering all of Canada and um, the northern part of the United States and large areas of Europe and, and uh, Russia. And they would last for about 100,000 years. And the ice built up from seawater that um, evaporated and then condensed once it reached the, the colder areas. And so the sea level dropped and the sea level dropped as much as 400 feet below where it is today. And it would last for about 100,000 years, or at least for the last 800,000 years or so, there's been a pretty good even periodicity. 100,000 years and then 10,000 year interglacial. And you can see CO2 levels match this. CO2 levels, we now know for the last 2.1 million years, the range of CO2. So in other words, going back to the tide pool example, we know the range that all of the ecosystems of the last two and a half million years have evolved in. And that's mostly the temperate zones, the forests in North America. Um, the tropical rainforests have been around for 250 million years, and so they have wider tolerances. But as far as our forests go, where I live up in Humboldt County, we've got the great giant redwoods. Um, those ecosystems developed their tolerances during the Pleistocene. And the CO2 range during the Pleistocene is between 170 and 280 parts per million. That's the natural range. So all of the ecosystems never really had to deal with anything higher than the absolute highest was 297 parts per million. So for two and a half million years, just between 170 and 280, in two, about 250 years ago, just before the Industrial Revolution began, it was up to 280 parts per million. And when it gets to 280, that's when it seems to kick in to a glacial period. So we were due to go into another glacial period. We'd been through 10,000 years of an interglacial. It was time to go into the next ice age. That's why people into the 1970s were talking about how there was global cooling, that we were going back into an ice age. And because it reversed around 1976, we started to see that it wasn't cooling anymore. It was warming. That's how we started to think about global warming actually kicking in, that it was um, actually a real world phenomenon. It wasn't just a theory anymore. Uh, Al Gore and I happened to have the same teacher, a guy named Roger Revell, and just coincidentally, the same year I was born, he started measuring atmospheric carbon dioxide at a laboratory in Hawaii at Mauna Loa. And so that was, um, since it was around the time I was born, between the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and 200 years later, when I was born in 1957, it had only gone up to 315. 
So it went from 280, which was already the top limit, up to 315, that's a 35 part per million increase over 200 years. Now, just during my lifetime, it's gone up 95 parts per million. So the first 200 years of the Industrial Revolution goes up 35 parts per million. In the last 60 years, it's gone up 95 parts per million. And we're now back up to where it was three to five million years ago in the Pliocene when the ice sheets were melting and sea level was 80 feet higher. So we're in this danger zone. Before that first breakup of the Larsen A, all the world scientists were thinking, and you have to keep in mind, again, we only started researching Antarctica in the late 1950s, they were thinking it would take one to 3,000 years for the West Antarctic ice sheet to melt. And they thought about it in terms of a giant iceberg, or a giant ice cube, that just slowly melts. They didn't think of it like crushed ice. If you crush the ice, then you have much more surface area and it melts quicker. So um, in 1995, when I saw that, I started to do a lot of research in the stacks at the Berkeley Public Library. I read every issue of Science and Nature magazine, every article that they published about polar ice, and um, New Scientist magazine. And uh, then I saw this article that was in Scientific American about a madhouse century. Now, as I mentioned, when you go in and out of these ice ages, sea level changes. So um, there were these scientists who were studying ancient coral records in the Bahamas. Now, coral is very interesting because it has to stay in that photic zone. So when you look at where prehistoric coral is on land, you can tell where the sea level was. So if it's 25 feet higher than coral is now, you can see that the sea level was 15 feet taller than that or whatever. So what they found was that 120,000 years ago, temperatures were about what they are now, sea level was about where it is now, and something happened. They didn't know what happened, but they could see in the prehistoric coral records that sea level suddenly went up 20 feet, and then it turned around and went down at least 50 feet, all in 100 years. And they called that the Madhouse Century. Now, because they're specialists in ancient sea level rise, they don't have experience in glaciology, they just published what they had discovered. They didn't speculate where that water came from. Where could water come from that would cause sea level to go up about, well, it's a net change, up 20 feet and down 50 feet. That's 70 feet of change in 100 years. So that means that sea level was going up about eight inches per year. Eight inches per year, can you imagine that? That's how much it's gone up over the last 100 years. So I started wondering, well, what could cause this? Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other scientists who have been talking about is global warming going to pose a threat to West Antarctica? And their answer was no, because it's going to take 1,000 or 3,000 years to melt. They had said that this 10% of the world's ice that covers West Antarctica, if it were to go, would cause 20 feet of sea level rise. So I realized that what happened 120,000 years ago, something had to cause 10% of the world's ice to melt very, very quickly. And that's when I started to look at Antarctica, and then later on Greenland. And when you realize that 90% of the world's ice is over Antarctica, and 80% of that is over East Antarctica, which is mostly in a bowl of mountains, it seems very unlikely that East Antarctica melted, or very much of it melted, 120,000 years ago. And uh, at, the t at that time, in, in the late 1990s, I didn't know much about Greenland, so I didn't speculate. But Greenland has about as much ice as West Antarctica. And nowadays, the scientists think that most of West Antarctica as well as a good chunk of Greenland melted 120,000 years ago. So then the question is, well, did um, West Antarctica melt? And then what happened? What caused the sea level to drop 50 feet? Well, you've heard the concern that the melting of the sea ice in the Arctic causes the top of the planet to be darker, and it absorbs more heat. Well, I think the op and that, that's causing more and more warming, and it's causing more melting of the sea ice. And it's also causing more melting of Greenland's ice sheet. But I think what happened 120,000 years ago was the exact opposite. 
You see, you've got this sea ice phenomenon in Antarctica that we showed you in the first picture. That doubles the area in the winter that's white, that's reflective. But it always melts back. That sea ice is only about four feet thick. Now, what happens if the ice on the continents were to be unleashed and expand over the same area? For example, most of Antarctica is between a mile and three mile thick. And it's surrounded by ice shelves. 97% of it is surrounded by ice shelves. And if these ice shelves, which float on water, if they melt, there's no real problem with sea level. But they're holding in the continental ice. Now, the way to picture this is, imagine making pancakes. You take your batter and you pour it down, right? So it pours down, and then the pancake expands outward. Well, that's happening with the ice, except with Antarctica, it's got this ring holding it in. But the gravity is still pulling down and would still cause it to expand outward. So what I think happened was, 120,000 years ago, these ice shells broke off, and then this three-mile thick ice, double, it, it basically became maybe a mile and a half thick ice, but it doubled the area. And that caused the Earth's albedo, that's the reflectivity of the Earth, to increase and did the exact opposite of the Arctic. It reflected more of the sun's heat away, and that caused a cooling that triggered us going into the last glacial period because that's exactly what happened. 120,000 years ago when the sea level went up and then went down, we went into the last glacial period, and we had an ice age for 100,000 years. Turns out that, um, you know, I was just an activist. I, I, I am trained as a scientist. I went to UC San Diego and trained with a lot of Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, professors. But still, I was just one guy. I'm not a peer-reviewed scientist. And I published a paper in 1998 in the Earth Island Journal sounding this warning that I thought that the madhouse century could happen again, that global warming, if it caused the West Antarctic ice sheet to break up, it could trigger a new ice age. So um, I was hoping that over the years, as I looked at the peer-reviewed science, that I'd be shown to be wrong because if the West Antarctic ice sheet breaks up and we have 20 feet of sea level rise, that's, it's almost over for civilization. 80% of the biggest, uh, 80 of the 100 biggest cities in the world live in the coastal areas that would be swamped by 20 feet of sea level rise. 80 of the 100 biggest cities. 10% of the human population lives in areas that will be covered by 10 feet of sea level rise. So the years went by. Nobody else seemed to put it together. The glaciologists didn't talk with the sea level people until 2009. And then some scientists published an article in Nature magazine saying that they had seen the same thing I saw 120,000 years ago happened a million years ago. And they pointed to West Antarctica and Greenland as the cause. So we have two situations where the West Antarctic ice sheet broke up, caused 20 feet of sea level rise, and in both cases it happened rapidly which is really critically important because people should no longer think about West Antarctica taking 1,000 to 3,000 years to break up. You'll see that in 2014, scientists down in Antarctica with NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and UC Irvine, they sounded an ominous warning. They said that the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet is now unstoppable. That's their word, not mine. That means the 20 feet of sea level rise is now unstoppable. There's nothing you can do to stop it. And the reason is, if you picture, uh, if you've ever been in a waterbed, and you sit in the middle of your waterbed, the, the vinyl or whatever it is, it pushes down in the middle. And the weight of West Antarctica pushes the land down too. So West Antarctica is sitting in a bowl under the ocean. And what's happened is the points that were holding it in place, the ice is melted back. And as we saw in that NASA video, just six glaciers on the Amundsen Sea, if they melt, that's going to cause four feet of sea level rise. And so when they go, then the rest of West Antarctica's ice sheet is going to start to go. And the problem is, it's pretty stable at the moment. So when this announcement was made in 2014, they just talked about that four feet of sea level rise from those six glaciers. But if you study the history of the ice sheet going back millions of years, you know that but what's, once that's gone, the rest of it is going to go. So they were talking in terms of 100 or 200 years. Then um, a year later, you'll see that in 2015, James Hansen's team 
working with these same NASA and JPL and UC Irvine scientists as well as many, many more around the world, they have now predicted that we're going to see 10 feet of sea level rise over the next 50 years. 10 feet over the next 50 years. And then a year later, there was a conference of 10,000 insurance industry risk assessment specialists and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration did a presentation there. And you may have heard Jill Stein talk about this, but they're predicting nine feet of sea level rise by 2050. Nine feet over the next 33 years. And then this year, the state of California has issued a report and theirs is a warning that there's gonna be 10 feet of sea level rise over the next 70 years. So things have changed very, very rapidly, yet nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it in politics especially. And that's the main reason why I'm a 2018 Ecotopian Democrat candidate for Congress. Uh, I feel that getting into Congress is a way to draw national attention to what's happening. So what do we do about it? It's, 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 um, it's very hard for me emotionally to, to be here talking to you about this because I feel like uh, I'm, I'm talking about the sky is falling. Um, if, if the 20 feet collapse, if the ice sheet collapse and 20 feet of sea level rise is unstoppable, and there's really no reason to think it isn't, ice is a very simple model. You've got water, you've got gravity, and you've got temperature. You increase the temperature, the ice melts. And um, gravity is, is pulling down on the ice sheet too. So what it means is we have to now figure out how to slow this down as much as possible. I believe what we have to do is get off fossil fuels as fast as humanly possible to get back down to that range of 170 to 280 parts per million, which is why I disagree with the 350.org people who say 350 is a safe level to get down to. 350 isn't safe because it's not the natural tolerance. 350 was based on the idea that if you got down to 350, you could limit the global temperature increase to 2 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial. But it's, you, you can't control the thermostat of the Earth like you can your living room. Um, what you have to do is think in terms of what is causing the heat to build up and get that fuel back down. And I think of CO2 molecules and the other greenhouse gas molecules as little heat sponges. So the more you put in the atmosphere, the more heat is held in. And a lot of people say, well, it hasn't warmed up that much. It's true compared to what a lot of people predicted, but that's because 90% of the heat was absorbed by the ocean. And that's also why West Antarctica is melting faster and faster um, than anybody ever imagined before. So um, the first thing is to buy ourselves as much time as possible. But there's not a lot we can do in terms of greening our personal lifestyle. Um, well, really, anything that anybody's proposing is not going to stop that 20 feet of sea level rise. And because there's so much variation in what the scientists say, people are still quoting the IPC, IPCC report that says we've got 1,000 to 3,000 years before it's going to melt. People confuse the melting of those six glaciers on the Amundsen Sea and four feet of sea level rise with, if West Antarctica melts, we're only going to have four feet of sea level rise. But we're going to have 20 feet of sea level rise. And now we have three reports saying that's all going to happen over the next century. We're going to have 10 feet of sea level rise over 50 years, 70 years, or maybe just 33 years. So, We've got a couple of major tasks we have to do. In a general sense, we have to start thinking, OK, how are we going to relocate a couple of billion people who live on the coasts of the world? Um, that's a bigger project than I can think about right now. I don't know how to do that, but that's what we, my fellow human beings, have to figure out over the next few decades. We have to figure out how to relocate all of civilization. All of our harbors are going to have to be rebuilt somewhere else. We can't really plan to do any kind of um, industrial development on the coast. In fact, I think what we should do is we should start 
encouraging people to move inland and then turn the coastal areas into agricultural areas. And that way we can grow food in areas. You know, I live, used to live in Los Angeles, and there's a lot of great farmland underneath the, the pavement. And so as people move away from there, you can pull up the pavement and you can start farming there. And then when sea level does start to kick in, see, here's the problem. What, what people really aren't talking about is that when West Antarctica goes, how fast is that going to happen? And if you look at what happened during the Madhouse century and what happened a million years ago, things stayed pretty hunky-dory, and then they suddenly started to go up eight inches per year. So um, that's something we can't wait for. We can't wait until we actually see the sea level rise before we do some things, like shutting down our coastal nuclear power plants. Now, this is why I'm here and why I'm doing this roadshow, because... Um, most of the coastal nuclear power plants are five feet above sea level. And if you use these predictions from these three studies, that means that about 25 to 35 years from now, they're going to be inundated by the ocean. Now, if you look into how we decommission our nuclear power plants, there's a procedure called safe store, S-A-F-S-T-O-R. And it takes 60 years to decommission a nuclear power plant turn off a nuclear power plant, you have to let those nuclear materials cool for many years before you can start to disassemble anything. So that's why I'm arguing that we have to, we, we, it takes 60 years to decommission them. They're going to be flooded in 25 to 35 years. <laughs> that's a problem because there's probably 50 nuclear power plants around the world. There's 400 around the world, but there's probably 50 of them that are on coastlines, maybe more. So what I'm seeing is 25 to 35 years from now, 50 Fukushimas, 50 Fukushimas. And the only way to prevent that is to start decommissioning them now. And that means two more things. We have to more than double the speed of decommissioning. We have to shorten that 60 year period down to less than 25 years. And we also have to finally decide what we're gonna do with the nuclear waste. Because if you wanna clear the coast of the nuclear power plants, where are you gonna put their nuclear waste? So here's Greenland. This is what Greenland actually looks like underneath the ice. And if you look uh, in the middle on the left side, you can see this Baffin Bay. You can see there's this huge basin. And it looks to me that in the past, when Greenland's ice has melted, it caused a huge waterfall hundreds of miles across. So there's a lot of ice there. And what's happening is the ice in Greenland is melting five times faster than West Antarctica. And uh, this is... Um, what the surface melt is looking like. Um, the first one is 1992. Uh, the orange area is area where the surface is melting. Then there's 2002 and then 2005. In 2012, 97% of the surface was melting. And part of the problem is that because they burn a lot of coal in Europe, a lot of that soot is collecting on the surface and just like the phenomenon in the Arctic Ocean where the sea ice is melting and so the dark ocean is revealed and it absorbs more heat you have these little pools that are developing on the surface of Greenland that are also increasing the heat on the surface. A Jason Box is a chief glaciologist for Denmark and Greenland and in 2014, he wrote for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that the temperature increase from pre-industrial for the total collapse of the Greenland ice sheet is somewhere between 1 degree and 4.2 degrees Celsius. We're at 1.2 degrees Celsius. So we're already in the red zone. So now we have a situation where we have politicians to this day that are still denying that global warming is real. Now, I believe that the people who kept us on this fossil fuel path, so we got up to 409 parts per million, and so that our ice sheets are collapsing, it's their policies that caused that to happen. So the climate denialist policies of keeping us on fossil fuels are to me traitorous because what is a national security threat? A national security threat is usually thought of as a military uh, a foreign military coming and attacking us, and then we have our military that fights them. And 
but if you think about, well, what are they doing? They're actually protecting our property. Remember, the Russians were supposed to come and take over America, or the Chinese with their huge army were going to come and take our property. So protection of property and protection of our lives, to me, are what national security is all about. So I would like to reframe national security because now what's happened is these politicians have guaranteed that every square foot of our coastlines, all of that property, personal, private, and public property, is going to be destroyed. Not only ours, it's also this incredible act of war because there's 131 other countries that have ocean coastlines. Because of the greenhouse gases that have been burned by the industrial nations, all of those countries are going to have their coastlines under 20 feet of water by the end of the century. So we need a way politically to get off fossil fuels. And uh, I've been involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, before Bernie coined his political revolution, I was arguing for an electoral revolution. I believe that all of the Republicans and most of the Democrats who are in Congress now, who have all of this big fossil fuel money, have to literally be removed. And they have to be replaced by citizen leaders from our community of, of whichever party, but people who are going into Congress to really take care of the people and take care of the planet. And so an electoral revolution, I believe, should focus on replacing members of Congress in 2018. A congressional district is about 700,000 people. So if people go into areas that we lost by a few thousand votes, well, let me back up here. In 2006, when the Democrats took over the, the House and Senate, there were about 17 seats that they won by 5,000 votes or less. And I thought, well, you can give credit to the bloggers for getting that 5,000 votes. So what if the next time around, we started to focus on the races that we lost by 5,000 votes? Those districts would be worth investing our activist time in organizing around year after year after year until we oust the conservative person who's in there. Um, and then you could you know, work on the areas where we lost by 10,000 votes or less. You could do this also in the primaries. Um, I helped start two Green Parties, the Citizens Party in 1980 and the Modern Green Party in 1985. And there are a lot of greenish progressive people in the Democratic Party and, and environmentally oriented people in the Libertarian Party and independents. And in the primaries, you could do the same kind of organizing and instead of a centrist Democrat winning, you could have a more progressive Democrat or a greener Democrat win. So Congress is where the policies that have gotten us here were developed. And Congress is where the solutions are going to have to be developed. We're going to have to come up with policies, a national energy policy that gets us off fossil fuels probably in 10 years or less. I mean, think about it. That seems extreme. But... We're already at 409 parts per million, you know? It's like a guy who's doing meth, you know, 20 times a day. You can't just say, well, you know, cut back to 19 times a day if you want the guy to live. And like I said, with these ecosystem tolerances in the tide pools and everywhere else, I mean, we're changing, I'm not even gonna get into the whole thing about acidification of the ocean, but there's all kinds of changes that are happening because of global warming. And when you change the ice, there's a whole set of um, very specific destructive um, consequences of that as well as what I'm talking about with sea level. It changes the, 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 the all kinds of aquatic life problems now in Antarctica and around Greenland um, because of the more fresh water entering. So um, we really, no one else is talking about getting off of fossil fuels. Currently, President Obama's plan, which is the only one that Democrats are talking about, is about getting off or, or getting down 90 percent by 2050. Okay, 33 years. But we could have 10 feet of sea level or 9 feet of sea level rise by then. So it's it's too late. So we we have to do something that's that's not just reform measures anymore. Uh, I'm starting a new online TV show at Facebook called Ecotopia or Extinction, Reform or Revolution. So I'd like you to ask yourself, when you go to vote for anybody, whatever party, and you think about global warming, you think about the ice sheet collapse, ask yourself, 
could this person going into Congress, could they actually do something that will make a difference? In other words, are there reform measures? Can they change um, something in the budget? Can they fund the Energy Department or the EPA more? And will that do it? Those are reform measures. And I think the answer is no. That's why Bernie and I both use the term revolution. Now, we're not talking about anything violent. We're both talking about using the ballot box for revolution. But what that means is we literally have to think about replacing a class of politicians. And it's the reason why I think a lot of people had problems with Hillary Clinton, um, because they recognized that Hillary Clinton was being backed by these same fossil fuel interests. She's for fracking. And, and so we have to think in terms of plutocrats. Now, plutocrats, you've heard about oligarchs, and we're supposedly Democrats with a small d, and we believe in democracy. But plutocrats are basically a class of elites. It's both the richest people and the politicians that they fund. So think of it like a mansion. Politicians go to a mansion, and they hang out, and they have a party with all these rich people. And those rich people give them money, and then they split, and they're going to get into Congress, and they're going to pass bills, but they're not going to pass bills that these rich people don't want. And that's the way it works with both those parties. So we really have to think about ousting the plutocracy. And, and I hope people will use that word, plutocrats, plutocracy, because that's really what's going on. As long as we're focused on Democrats versus Republicans, um, we're, we're losing the game. Democrats and Republicans and everybody else have to come together. We are all human beings on this planet, and we all have the same threat. Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, Greens, their property is going to be wiped out by this sea level rise. Their, the future, I mean, it's, it's, I don't have any children, but the future for children and grandchildren, I mean, imagine a world 10, with 10 feet of sea level rise 35 years from now. If you've got a teenager, your teenager is going to be 40 years old when that happens. This is, this is just the greatest crisis humanity has ever had to face. And it means we have to do things that we haven't done before. Right? So that's why it's, I think reform won't work. Uh, an electoral revolution is the only way to go. This is by a great, great Native American political leader who died recently, John Trudell. And this is called September 19th. Today I challenge the nukes. The soldiers of the state place me in captivity, or so they thought. They bound my wrist in their plastic handcuffs, surrounding me with their plastic minds and faces. They ridiculed me, but I could see through to the ridicule they brought on themselves. They told me, squat over there by the trash can. They left a soldier to guard me. I was the Viet Cong. I was crazy horse. Little did they understand, squatting down in the earth, they placed me with my power. Mother Earth is my power to laugh, laugh at their righteous wrong. Their sneers and their taunts gave me clarity to see their powerlessness. It was in the way they dressed and in the way they acted they viewed me as an enemy, a threat to their rationalizations. I felt pity for them, knowing they will never be free. I was their captive, but my heart was racing through the generations, the memories of eternity. I was beyond their reach. I would be brought to the internment camp to share my time with my allies. The last time I saw them, they were standing in their 12-hour shifts, addicted to their chain of command, waiting to be told what to do, forgetting about me, thinking I was just another protester they were finished with, never understanding I am not finished with them, for I am the resistance, and as always, I will return. Here's another one called Very Eyes. I see your tech no logical society devour you before your very eyes. I hear your anguished cries exalting greed through progress while you seek material advances. The sound of flowers dying carry messages through the wind trying to tell you about balance and your safety. 
but your minds are chained to your machines and the strings dangling from your puppeteer's hands, turning you, twisting you into forms and confusions beyond your control. Your mind for a job, your mind for a TV, your mind for a hairdryer, your mind for consumption with your atom bombs, your material bombs, your drug bombs, your racial bombs, your class bombs, your sexist bombs, your ageist bombs, devastating your natural shelters, making you homeless on earth, chasing you into illusions, fooling you, making you pretend you can run away from the ravishing of your spirit, while the sound of flowers dying carry messages through the wind trying to tell you about balance and your safety. Uh, this is um, called After the Breakdown by Dwight Worker. Hidden inside moated neighborhoods, cloned up with others like yourself, praying for that world just to go away. But your security guards aren't coming back. Most of your food, it was pre-frozen. Without electricity, it'll go bad pretty soon. Buy dry goods in bulk when the store was so near. And instead of a garden, go eat your Kemlon grass. You ask yourself, you ask each other whether you'll be safe. You don't ask me, but I think I know. After the breakdown, your land deeds are only as good as your supply of food and ammo. Without gas, are you going to push your car and escape? Now really, just where would you go? So barricade your doors and your windows and welcome, welcome, welcome to your own private Alamo. That's it. I hope if you want to support this Clear the Coast Roadshow and getting the, world, the word out, you can check um, my website, andycaffrey.org, and you can get more information there. And if you'd like to finance the cost of doing this roadshow, please go to paypal.me slash andycaffrey. Thank you very much. Now, part of the reason why we haven't done anything about West Antarctica or really about global warming is because of the framing that we have, the things that we tend to think about, especially as Americans. And we can get so distracted by situations in our immediate environment that we have a hard time thinking about problems that are not going to really manifest and affect us for decades or even centuries. So what I'd like to do is... Um, sing a song that's a little tribute to uh, the consciousness that seems to be filling our minds today with our president and especially with what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is by Lee Goland. It's been five years since you've had a raise in pay. Way things are going, you could get laid off any day. Sure is hard to live with all this pain. You need a power, a scapegoat that you can blame. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. It's all their fault. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got some balls. 
Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got no class. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. Let's send them back. Your neighborhood library is gonna close. And the school your kids go to is becoming a joke. Self-serving liberals blame it on corporate tax breaks. But that's propaganda you know you should hate. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. It's all their fault. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got some balls. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got no class. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. Let's send them back. Who's to blame for the things you're pissed off about? Who's to blame for inflation, unemployment, and drought? Who's to blame for the end of the good old days? Who's to blame for the fact that you can't get laid? Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. It's all their fault. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got some balls. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. They've got no class. Teenage immigrant welfare mothers on drugs. Let's send them back. Thank you. 